You are listening to Heroes Never Die, your one-stop spot for all the latest news, Overwatch League results, and mishaps in Overwatch. Here are your hosts, Totally Drunk and Edinar. Uh, yes, uh, you know, I'm doing good at a minor family emergency yesterday. Uh, everything's all good, so no worries there. Uh, but I had to be out of town and take care of the niece. I got to play Princess all night and watch, uh, God, what is the name of that stupid, stupid show? Doc McStuffins. Mm. I watched a lot of Doc McStuffins yesterday. So I had that going for me. Uh, but no, like uh, like you said, we recorded... Uh, episode for our little passion fantasy overwatch league podcast owl by the numbers uh on tuesday with you know bob and julian gulian and you know it i'm very excited for it uh ready to to play after the after the podcast today because it's been a few days since i've been able to actually play overwatch so yeah overall and you know things are looking good things are looking good how have you been uh, well, my mic was completely muted during the intro, but I'm just gonna forget that even happened for the live show. Uh, Wait, does Mel oh, Kari know? Oh, OBS hates me today, apparently, guys. I'm, I'm sorry. Uh, but you know what? I didn't turn on my computer. We're still live, so there's that, so, uh... That's something, I guess. Uh, but my week's been pretty good. You know, there's been a lot going on. A ton of stuff with competitive Overwatch, especially with contenders. We got a ton of playoffs going on. We had Grand Finals. We had Europe. We had NA. We had Team Gaganti beat Angry Titans in the EU, which was fantastic. Uh, Davin is probably still going to be stuck in Contenders Jail, as per usual. Uh, whether or not, you know, the entire team of Gaganti gets, you know, poached outside of him, I don't know. Uh, but we also saw ATL Academy... Uh, in the Grand Finals for NA, which we will be going into a little bit further tonight. But all in all, you know, it's been a it's been a pretty good week. Uh, it's not been, like, the busiest week in Overwatch, like, the actual game per se, but there's been a lot of stuff going on uh, revolving around the community and to esports. So let's go ahead and let's jump right into the thick of things. Uh, first, by going over some of the uh, general Overwatch news. So, as you guys are all aware of, we have an event going on right now, which uh, has, you know, everything to do with the Anna uh, short story that was released alongside, uh, you know, we, we had Soldier 76. Uh, we got introduced to some new characters, some new love interests, all of that. And Bastet is in full swing, and Blizzard actually went out and commissioned someone to create... Uh, you know, some content for it, and it went to one of the popular animators on YouTube, uh, who is Dylan, and he created, uh, a, a Ketsu Watch animation that ties in directly with the event. So, if you're not familiar with this animator, he's basically been doing a lot of, like, anime crossovers with Overwatch, and Ketsu Watch is basically where he turns everything and all things Overwatch-related, uh, you know, the heroes into cats, and, uh, it's, you know, very comedic in some retrospects, uh, and, you know, the animated short sees cat versions of Anna and Soldier 76 as he battled it out on Temple of Anubis, and, you know, we get to see some, you know, uh, some mafia-looking mice in it, uh, and, uh, the mouse that they're actually hunting down is none other than Hakim, who, you know, we know plays a role in, uh, the short story, and, you know, this is all purely fun, you know, completely non-canon, and I have to say, like, the funniest part of this animation to me was when we, we saw the mouse basically, like, uh, 
You know, like in Mario, how the, like, there's the, the mushroom that makes you grow in size? You know, it basically makes you Hulk out. <laughs> well, this mouse just transforms. You know, he is like almost a uh, hundred times his original size, and then, you know, he just eats a sleep dart, and then it was all downhill from there. And I have to say, like, the, the tail end of it was absolutely hilarious when we, uh, when we see Mercy basically sitting down with Anna, having a, a cup of tea, and, like, she's shaking because of, uh, she's kind of, like, rattled because not only does she know that Anna is alive, but she also knows that Soldier 76 is there. Also, you know, sleeping due to, uh, you know, whatever drugs that Anna gave him in the comics. So, all in all, like, you know, I wasn't expecting that much from this, but, like, I always like when we see community engagement and for Blizzard to go out of their way and, you know, uh, commission someone that has been gaining a lot of popularity is always nice to see. Like, all right, so it was very cute. And the sleep dart on the gigantic guy with Soldier hitting him, at, waking him up with hitting him with the fish like is the most overwatch thing ever <laughs> but oh my god cat stuff on the internet is legit the last thing this anyone needs mm -hmm. if we were to get rid of one genre of videos on the internet cat related videos that would be number one but with that said this was pretty cute um i'm glad you know you know that blizzard probably didn't spend any time making this like you said, like Blizzard's just like, yeah, slap an official Blizzard thing on it, make it, have fun, show it to us so we can like veto it or give it the okay and, you know, go to town. They didn't have to do anything. So this was awesome for Blizzard. Blizzard's like, yeah, we're getting out another video, an animated short, so we don't have to show you one of our professionally done animated shorts. Yeah, so we can delay it, like, another yeah. seven months. You're like, oh, you guys got one last week. You guys are good for another four or five months. Mm -hmm. Like, no, Blizzard, that's not how it works, but I, I see what you're doing here. Um, but, no, it was it was cute. I enjoyed it. It was it was a good one. Just, just no cats. Next time, use dogs. I felt bad for the mice. Is that bad? I felt bad for the mice. I feel they were getting bullied. I mean... they don't show them doing anything wrong. Really, when you look at it, the only people doing something wrong and causing violence, Anna and Soldier. Yeah. Mice, and mice did nothing. You know, I, I, I don't know how Anna was so acrobatic in this one. You know, she got to uh, some unintended locations. She's a grandma. <laughs> how is she getting that much, like... She probably broke a hip. I don't know. I'm going out on a limb on what, that one. What, what I will say is this animation was complete with the the superhero Landon. You know, mm -hmm. there there was that moment. <laughs> <laughs> superhero Landon. That's just that's just not realistic. Mm -hmm. it's so much. And you know, that's oh, probably God. how she broke something. I'm, I'm yeah, not sure. That's of how it. she broke her hip. <laughs> all right. See, it's all coming full circle mm -hmm. now. Absolutely. Uh, well, in merchandise news, uh, we got some news out of Funko, uh, who are expanding their Overwatch options by releasing a set of Overwatch plush dolls. So, the first wave of these plush dolls will include uh, five different heroes. So, we're going to get Sombra, Tracer, Reaper, Winston, and Roadhog. Now, I have to say, like, the, the details on this are very scarce. They didn't say, like, any sort of release date or let you know, like, who's going to be carrying them. But if the pass is any indicator, you know, Funkos are available both on the Blizzard Gear store. You can buy them physically uh, at a number of different locations. I know uh, traditionally, like, they've kind of done, like, exclusive stuff with, like, Hot Topic and uh, their sister store, Lunchbox. Uh, you know, from time to time, you might get something like Target, Walmart for exclusives. GameStop. GameStop yeah. would be another one. Uh, so I'm not expecting anything too far out of the ordinary in that regard. But, like, I, I, I don't know if the plushies will have exclusive ones based on the retail stores. But I will expect that this is going to be another thing that we are going to see multiple waves of. And, you know, this is another <coughs> one of those scenes that... Uh, it's it's not to be for everyone. It kind of has like a chibi uh, style mm -hmm. to the plush dolls. So it's not something I'm going to buy. Uh, probably something that my niece will absolutely love. So if I do buy one, it will be for her. 
not so much for me, uh, but what were your thoughts on the expansion of Funkos? No, I like the expansion of Funkos. I mean, they're not for me because, like, in my Funko Pops, I like them to be just kind of sitting there, like, Mm -hmm. on a shelf, sitting, you know, nice and neat. Plushes don't tend to sit nice and neat or sit uniformly. Like, you, you can't have these Funko plushes mixed in with the Funko Pops. That's just, they don't mesh. Yes, they're both made by Funko, but they just look different. Mm-hmm. So you're not going to have them mixed in. Like you said, this is probably geared more towards a younger audience and collectors, like Spider. Like, Spider will buy all these. Ah, uh, I don't know. I he spends a he lot will. on the other Funkos. I don't think he needs to expand it even further. Yeah, I still think he's going to. Well, I'm going out on a limb. We'll ask him immediately after the recording. Yes. Um... One thing that did surprise me about this was no mercy. Mm-hmm. Like, usually mercy is included with all this. Like, I kind of surprised Somber's included with the first wave. But maybe they wanted to save mercy for the next wave to have like that signature character because the two other signature characters are Tracer and Winston, and they're both in this. So, you know, but they're they're cute, they're adorable, but not for me. So, kind of getting back to uh, the Best at events, you know, we've had a number of different streamers uh, that have been kind of, like, taking over Blizzard HQ, streaming from there, and our, our dev and savior, Papa Jeffy Cap Cap, praise Reason. him, he has been making his rounds, and I have to say, like, when he appeared on Fran's stream, boy, did we get some spice. <laughs> the claws were out, and uh, yeah, it was it was pretty funny. Uh, and I know some people are gonna take this completely out of context, based on some of the things he said, or people are gonna be like, "Really, Jeff? Really?" Or some people are just gonna be like, "Oh, Tickle is back to his old ways." Uh, but anyways, so he he sat down with Fran to discuss the game's meta. So when Jeff was asked if he believed that each meta has an expiration date, he basically said, you know, I don't, but the players do. So, you know, there's, there's kind of like this weird thing. Every single meta we've ever had, eventually, the players hate. I think people are overreacting a little bit. I would appreciate more educated testing on the PTR. I'd like to see people actually play stuff and give us feedback on the PTR about what is actually happening. I think what's inevitably... Inevitably, going to happen is whether the meta changes or not, people will end up not liking the current meta. Okay. So. I agree to the part that no matter what, people won't like the meta. Correct. But, you know, I know the PTR is there. But if everything just goes from PTR to live without any changes... (laughs) But that can, that can go back to not enough people are testing it and leaving con- constructive, constructive criticism <laughs> on the stuff. Like, they may not know it's broken, like, or this needs to be touched, this needs to be changed. Because most of the time, people just go on there and putz around once or twice, mm-hmm. and then they're done on the PTR. They need people to go on there and, like, test it out, do real comps do stuff like that, and actually play with it, and then report stuff. And if people aren't doing that, then why would they change anything that's on it if they're not getting any reports saying that this is broken? Reddit doesn't count as constructive criticism. I'm sorry, Reddit. (laughs) Reddit is a cesspool. Like, I'm sorry, Reddit. Overall, cesspool. Mm -hmm. Uh, And 99% of what they say on Reddit is just useless. Like, so... It's you, you, you leave constructive criticism, don't swear, don't like, and this is every game you see. Like, you heard this from Warcraft all the time. Now they just don't allow everyone into the beta or on the PTR and stuff like that because, you know, got so toxic. They only allow select people in there. So it almost feels like a privilege to go on there and test stuff out. Maybe they start doing something like that. Like, only allow specific people to go on, like, Give out PTR beta passes. 
to specific people. So it almost feels like a privilege to go on there. And then people will actually go on there and play, not make it open to everyone. I, I mean, I don't know. I don't think there's a good answer or bad answer, but a lot of it is like, yeah, like you said, nothing ever changes from PTR to live. But it could also be a fact that people aren't giving constructive criticism on what's on the PTR. So the, they don't change it. The, the thing that's always weird to me about PTRs is... More times than not, there's really never an incentive for the players to actually test the stuff out. And it's it's a little bit different for Overwatch in the sense that this game, just due to the complexity of it, there's never going to be a time in Overwatch's lifespan where there is going to be perfect balance. So the, the whole testing idea of going on the PTR, kind of seeing what's there and giving feedback... It almost kind of feels like, to an extent, it really doesn't matter, because at the end of the day, like, there's always going to be the typical Blizzard uh, balance act where, you know, let's say something's overpowered, then it will nerf it to the ground, and then they'll fine-tune it, like, five months maybe after the fact, and at the end of the day, like, the cycle of which things are patched to live or... You know, how quickly balance changes are done to kind of flip the switch on the meta or at the perception of the meta. It's never quick enough for the fan base. And I feel like it's a lose lose situation if you are on, you know, the Overwatch development team. Uh, but I, I do want to quickly note that uh, Jeff did mention the perception of meta, which is, is important because, you know, when it comes to Overwatch, the game is not the same in every single tier of competitive play. Obviously, what's happening in Master, GM, Top 500 is a completely different monster than what you and I personally deal with when, you know, we're playing in anywhere from Silver to Plat. Like, mm -hmm. we really don't see GOATs. No. If ever. Uh, there may be very few instances where it works. Or we actually see it, but it's not actually played correctly <laughs> in, in most regards. Uh, yeah. But I, I love what Jeff said here, and this is the part that I know people are just going to just kind of scoff at. <laughs> and he says, at a certain point, I'm like, what the hell do you people want? Just go play Mystery Heroes. If you want random heroes every match, Mystery Heroes is now available for you in the arcade. You're super awesome, and there is no meta. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, I mean, it's true. Like, he, he went on to say, sell the diamond rank, you know, like, meta is regarded. Like, like mm -hmm. there's no meta. Like, like you said, there's there's no meta to us. Now, that is true and untrue. Like, what he's technically saying about the actual gameplay for us is 100% true. If you're sell the diamond, there is no meta. There just isn't. Anyone who says that and anyone who complains about the meta in, you know, di gold, diamond, you know, all that stuff, there is no meta. So you can shut up about that. But people like me and you can complain about GOATs from a esports perspective. I think, I mean, that is my issue with GOATs. I, to me, GOATs is not overpowered because I don't see GOATs. I don't play GOATs. I play JOATs. <laughs> um... <laughs> Yes, jump right, goats. Um, but I am not the biggest fan of watching goats play. So goats for the meta for the top tier, that is something that is very prevalent out there. And I don't enjoy watching it. Like, I don't enjoy the, the 6v6, Zarya, Ryan, Diva, you know, Lucio, Brig, you know, and then... Then they have, like, the mystery, like, oh, are we going to use Moira? Are we going to use Zen? Like, what's going on? That's that's not enough, you know, <laughs> changing it up. But uh, that's where I have my issue with the, the meta, or the meta as you call it, like, as you define it, is I don't enjoy watching it as an eSport. I prefer Dive over, over um, Goats, personally. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying I want Dive back because, you know, there are certain characters that, I don't think should be mandatory for every map on offense and defense. And that's where I think they need to, to make some adjustments, at least for the high end game. Like at this point, I would much rather them start making PTR changes for the top tier 
only. Like stuff just targeted at, you know, Grandmaster, Master and Grandmaster and above. Because to me, where I'm at, the game is fairly balanced. Like you can really go in, like you can go in with six supports and win a comp match where we're at. Like that's completely plausible. You can't do that in Masters and Grandmasters. <laughs> So I think balancing the game now more on a Masters and Grandmasters level, which would turn into OWL level, is something that would benefit the actual eSport aspect of the league. Um, so that's, I mean, that's just my two cents on that. So, so Jeff is right and wrong. To, to that note, what I will say is uh, we recently had Pro Pugs this past mm -hmm. weekend that was streamed from Blizzard headquarters. Strain was the one kind of putting it together. We had a ton of Overwatch League players that were playing, you know, the new stuff, new changes, new everything. And weird. What did they play? They played a lot of goats, which is, uh, you know, Jake, Jake even tweeted out, uh, you know, <laughs> I think Imani mentioned something about the meta earlier today, and Jake was like, yeah, we're, we're still seeing goats like 75 plus percent of the time. Uh, yeah, Monty tweeted out saying that he's like, don't say the sky's falling yet. A lot of these teams haven't, you know, are just getting to LA now and doing their eight, 10 hour practices. Mm -hmm. So they haven't had a lot of time to practice, try and counter, try and come up with the new meta. So like, don't say that this GOATS is going to be the meta going into, you know, season two because they haven't practiced. But I think that's just to calm people's nerves because we all know GOATS is coming. I would be hard pressed if Goats is not the stage one meta. Yeah, I I, I, I still feel like regardless, like when you factor in how late some of the visas have been getting issued, some players don't even have it yet. How late people are gonna be arriving just due to that? Uh, the amount of practice time on that current patch on the PTR. Uh, which is going to be live for Season 2, according to Nate Nancer, that was confirmed earlier today. There's a really, really leave a lot of wiggle room, so uh, mm -hmm. I'm not going to tell people to hold their breath and hope for change, but... Uh... I will say, I will say we are probably, with these changes on the PTR, I'm not saying GOATS is not going to be played, because it will be played on 75% of all the maps. But I think it opens up the possibility of certain map comps. Because, you know, like, for instance, Junkertown. Mm -hmm. I mean, stage one, or season one, you know, nobody's playing Bastion on any other map, but on Junkertown, Bastion was meta. We've, like, we've seen it quite a bit lately in Hanamura. Yeah, like, it's... Yeah, we have. That's just weird. <laughs> um, but it's it's like, it's one of the... You're going to see map-specific metas with the majority of them being GOATs. But you're going to start seeing some other teams where, like, you know, we'll talk about this when we talk about Fusion Uni versus, you know, uh, LNL is, you know, Ash might start seeing some play. Uh, McCree might start seeing some play. Reaper, I still don't think he's going to get any play. Um, you know, sorry, Reaper fans, but Reaper still sucks. Um, so, you know, but you're still going to see different comps on different maps, but the majority is going to be GOATs. Absolutely. Uh, well, with that being said, you know, I, a lot of people are still freaking out about Reaper for, for some reason. He still has all the same issues. Uh, but at a lower level, who knows? Maybe he'll be more viable. I don't know. We gotta do some more testing at our level. But let's go ahead. Let's move on. Let's jump into this week's hot community topic. So first up, we had uh, some pretty major shakeups in the XL2 Academy camp after their loss in the Overwatch Contenders Season 3 playoffs. So what is going on with XL2 Academy? Well, uh, they've uh, decided to basically let a majority of the team go. So they started by dropping three of their players. They released Clone Man, Goliath, and Mingachu. So this basically happened after XL2 posted a call for tryouts on their Twitter page, noting that they were looking for New York-based players to represent the team in the 2019 season. So what they planned on doing is they're going to have an online tournament, which they'll use to be scouting players. They'll have it open to top 100 players that are in the tri-state area. Uh, so for those that aren't aware, that's New York, New Jersey, Connecticut... 
It's a tri-state area, so not not the biggest area. Uh, and the people who at the time were still on the roster were Wu Yol, Tizzy, Logix, and Jer. Now, since then, Logix also posted that he was looking for a team, so he's no longer with XL2 Academy. And this is a team that finished in third place this current season that just wrapped up. And then last season, they lost in the grand finals to Fusion University, which was a complete raffle stump. Uh, I don't know how else to describe that. But the decision to drop established players from the team in order to make room for localized talent has really caused an uproar within the community, especially when considering the fact that Goliath, or one of them, I don't know if it's Goliath or it's Clomad, one of them I know is from New York, or at least he's in that area. So that, that was like a hot uh, discussion point. But it's important to note before we dive further into this, that in this upcoming season, or well this year, uh, in these seasons, Contenders is introducing regional soft locks for their rosters. So while we, we still don't have the rulebook for the new season yet, but I know Benchmob, who's been one of the primary uh, you know, reporters for Overwatch, said that non-resident players signed to contracts prior to October 28th will be temporarily grandfathered into the 2019 Season 1 and will not count towards a three-player non-resident limit. So while we still wait on clarification from the League, or, you know, Overwatch contenders, on what determines a resident, more than likely that just means that a resident uh, resident is a citizen and legal permanent, uh, permanent resident of countries within the region. So, based off of that, there is a very good chance that, uh, you know, just due to how the dates work, that Tizzy and Wu Yol would not count towards that non-resident limit on this team. So theoretically, XL2 Academy could still go out, they could pick up three Korean players, and then, you know, they would have one more spot on their roster. They could always find, you know, that one local hero or whoever ends up looking good in the tournament. Or, you know, maybe they'll find a better player and then that local talent will just be right in the bench. I don't know, but, you know, there's very cynical ways that you can kind of look at this about Excel 2 Academy. <coughs> but at the end of the day, like, a, a lot of people are kind of up in arms about the decision, at least from a PR perspective, because a lot of people are feeling like this just puts them in a bad light. I mean, yeah, I think I get why people think it puts them in a bad light, but the way the system is set up, I think this is kind of genius because all right in theory in theory in a perfect world the contenders team is like uh like a gateway for the team the the cont the overwatch league team to like funnel in new players into their team well that's not the way contenders works like <clears throat> anyone can sign anyone from another contenders team any overwatch team can sign a contenders player from any team you're not locked down to your Overwatch League team. Like your your sister company, your parent company. So like what's the point of of spending all these resources to truly like build a big team, like a really good team, knowing that they're probably going to go just sign with another Overwatch League team. Like you're putting in all these resources and all this money into building up these players for them to go sign with another team, and make another team better. Like to me, that 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 doesn't make sense. Now, Overwatch League could really change this by making like it a true minor league team, and that would encourage better scouting from the Overwatch League rosters. But that's just not how it's set up. I mean, look at Fusion University, three times champions. Spoiler, spoiler, <laughs> three time champions. How many of the Fusion University players are on the Fusion? Exactly. Like, one. <laughs> one. There's one. and He hasn't played yet for him. Exactly. Like, their best DPS player, Zachary, playing for Dallas. Like, who are you is somewhere in Korea. Eh, I, 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 I would argue that who are you is a better DPS player, but that's besides the point. All right. Best DP, DPS player that's allowed to play in the Overwatch League right now. Yes. <laughs> All right. 
you know, uh, you know, alarm. Some godforsaken reason is not on an Overwatch League team. Is he eighteen? Probably not. Otherwise, you know, okay, he'd be in. I'll I'll see if I can find that info while you talk. Yeah, yeah, because then he's going to be on Chicago next year. Um, but like that's just kind of what I'm saying. Like you have all these co- top contenders players going to play for other Overwatch League teams. Why should the organization pay to build up all these exceptional players if they're not given the right to them? Mm-hmm. Now, with New York, is in a different case. Even if they had an exceptional player on their contender team they don't have room like right. they legit have like they could have the top six players and contenders and it'd be like well you're still bottom five on our <laughs> on our overwatch league team we're not going to use the roster spots on you so like i get it i get why i get both sides i get why the community is up in arms about this but i get why new york did it like it's it's a smart business move. Mm-hmm. Uh, they're taking advantage of the system given to them by Overwatch. Like, there's no real incentive for winning the Overwatch contenders. Like, yes, you get a, a decent prize amount, but you're guaranteed a spot the next year, no matter what. So your team could suck. Your team could do great. But if you go out there and you get the talents that like sign with other teams. You get a small bonus from that. Like, it's just, I don't know. There's there's no real incentive for New York to build a super roster in contenders. Especially when they couldn't win anyway. Yeah, exactly. And why not build up the local scene? Like, New York, the New York fan base is the best fan base. I'm sorry, but they're the best fan base in Overwatch League. Like, the mo- the, they're the most passionate. Like, outside of... LA teams during the actual Overwatch League season because everyone's playing in LA New York has the most presence up there like you had the New York pop-up stuff and like people are going to New York that's where they had the grand finals they are just the more out there like social in your face team that people love and you know why not keep building that up in New York and really build a New York fan base Mm -hmm. Because, I mean, it's not like New York is a small town, you know. And they they mentioned in this article about them, like, teaming up with high schools, teaming up with universities, like Rutgers and stuff like that in the area. Um, you know, OWL Jersey Shore. That could be a reality <laughs> show. Come on. No. <laughs> yes. Yes. Imagine Sebaobi and Pine on the Jersey Shore. With Mangachu, if he was still on the team, that would be hilarious. No, I'm not, I'm not I gonna just buy got, into did it. I just get fired from Blizzard reality? <laughs> yeah, I feel, like, I feel I did already. Uh, but but anyways, to uh, just a circle back to Alarm really quick, Edinar, because you were wondering, Alarm currently is 17. He turns 18 July 21st. Okay, so it's gonna be a mad dash to sign that kid. Because he's probably the best support player in NA Contenders. I think he actually is the best support. His teammate's probably better, but he's signed. So, yeah. <laughs> so yeah. Yeah, he's... If he's not a midseason sign-in, I'm done. Like, it, there, there's no, no reason why he shouldn't be. <laughs> but... He should sign with uh, Second Wind. Because second wind will be signed by Chicago. Mm-hmm. See, you know, I, think... I, I have this sinking feeling <laughs> that's not going to that happen. Canada, Canada is going to swoop in and nope on us again. If they get a third team before Chicago does, I, I no, I mean, drive... okay, I mean for academy purposes, like okay. they would like. I have this feeling it's going to be Toronto. Toronto's going to go out, they'll pick up second wind as their academy team, and then I'm just, we're just going to have more fuel to the fire for how many, you know, just another reason why we have such a passionate dislike for Canada outside of the reviews out of Canada, which are fantastic. But anyway, not, not, for, me. <laughs> not for you, no. But, you know, I'm here to balance it out, uh, right, as, right. as we have talked about in the past. 
you know, it's perfect, perfectly balanced as everything should be. But moving on, uh, we do have some updates on Overwatch League preseason Qu- quotes. <laughs> it's not a preseason. It's it's totally not. But this kind of like brings us back to the pro pugs that Jane was running. We had a a special guest, that being none other than the Overwatch League commissioner Nate Nancer, stopping by. And Nancer basically noted, you know, uh, seasons one, season one preseason was more of a dress rehearsal type of thing it was more of a production test not so much for like the players all of that and he notes that a few days before the start of overwatch league season two they'll have what he's calling a community countdown which is more of a show match styled event you know jane was hard pushing for anna paintball to be a featured event and uh we have bench mob who was reporting an update on the community countdown and he says now Bear in mind, this isn't official yet from the Overwatch League, but, you know, he's been a very credible source. Uh, He says that the Community Countdown is set to take place between February 9th through the 12th, with a media day happening on February 13th. Each team will play one practice match. Other events will include a Capture the Flag tournament between experienced teams and Ash and Anna paintball games. So... A lot of people might look at that and be like, well, what, why so close to the season? And it kind of circles back to the visa issues that a lot of players are having right now. There were visa applications that were put in late. So a lot of these players are going to be arriving in the U.S. over the next several weeks. So, you know, they're going to have it as close to season two as possible to make sure that everyone can be a part of this event. But, you know, let, let's talk about what what this event actually is going to be like are you upset that we're not getting an official preseason do you feel like this is going to have a major impact on these newer expansion teams that are coming in to compete for the first time yes i think this is the wrong move on overwatch league's part uh i i feel like a preseason is exactly what especially the new expansion teams need they need to get used to that environment like they need to get used to the 6v6 crowd going crazy competitive match, not 6v6, let's play capture the flag crap. Like, I'm sorry. Like, and to only do the uh, the capture the flag tournament between just expansion teams, well, then what about the other teams? Are the other teams too good? Like, one practice match is not enough. This is all star game type play. This is not, let's get ready for this massive Overwatch League, you know, mm-hmm. season to start. Uh, now, with that said, I am throwing down a bet with you right now. Okay. Finger bangs, finger bangs versus Yetis. Capture the flag. Loser has to get a skin of the other team. <laughs> That's fine. Okay. okay. I'm throwing that out there right now. So well, well, we'll see if they prepared. actually play one another. <laughs> okay, yeah. First, they have to play one another. But, yeah, when they play, yeah. Finger bangs versus the Yetis mm-hmm. for a skin. <laughs> but it's just, it's, it's more happy-go-lucky. They're going to have cheeky shenanigans. Like, they'll probably have Jake do some of the announcing that... They always seem what, to really what, push Jake what, down our throats. What they should do is purposely have Jake play Reaper after how much he trash talked Reaper's hero design during the Pro Pugs. I mean, the thing is, is he's not wrong. He's not wrong, but <laughs> Nate Manzer really kind of tore it. Jake, mm-hmm. he announced one game during the Pro Pugs, and Nate Manzer's like, "Jake, stick to your day job." Mm-hmm. Like Nate threw some shade at at Jake, and I loved it. Um, so one thing he did say that I, I, I don't know if you watched the whole thing that I'm very intrigued about uh, during the stream with Jane was the postseason. Mm-hmm. He hinted that he's like, they can't get into what's going to happen and how everything's going to break down and all that. But more information will be coming out shortly about what's going to happen with the postseason. And by that, I'm assuming he meant like the the actual postseason you know not not the not the stage perhaps. i'm i wouldn't be surprised if the actual postseason he's just like and it's mystery heroes <laughs> no there's no meta <laughs> there's no meta mystery heroes limits mm-hmm. for five hundred thousand dollars 
you're like, ah, uh, go to hell. But, uh, you know, yeah, it's... I wish if they did, like, uh, a week of... Like, a week of practice matches and then mm-hmm. a week of, like, fun time, happy-go-lucky games and then went in, I'd be happy. But this is all going to probably happen in one week or in, like, four days. So, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, I would imagine... You're not gonna, you're, I would imagine just based on how it sounds like, it seems like one day would basically just be the actual matches where... Well, actually, it would probably be both. The first two days would be actual matches, and then the third day would kind of be, you know, the the dick around, you know, CTF and the paintball modes. Mm-hmm. But yeah, it's just... I, I don't know how it's all going to work out. We'll wait for them to say anything. I mean, they have to... They have to announce it soon. It's, you know, it's January 17th. Mm-hmm. This is supposed to happen in three weeks. The The big thing for me is you need to let these newer players practice their walkout. <laughs> you, you know, it kind of brings it back to the whole, you know, just experience of being at land because not all the players have land experience. They just need to get used to the environment so they can be more at ease whenever the season does start just so they can, you know, get their nerves underneath them uh, so they won't be as pressured in that situation when... You know, the cameras and the spotlight is yeah, on like, center stage. Yeah, they don't have to deal with any of that stuff in Contenders. Because for some reason, land tournaments don't exist in Contenders this year. Nope. Sorry. A little bitter. But, little but, there is some promising news, guys. We'll get to it. But before we get into that, let's go inside the Path to Pro and the Overwatch League. So, uh, we did have the Contenders North America playoffs. Literally the entirety of the playoffs, so uh, this all happened since our last recording last Wednesday. So, Ed, why don't you go uh, let everyone know what went down in the quarterfinals and into the semifinals, and then we'll break uh, down a little bit of the Fusion University championship win, which was back-to-back-to-back titles for FUN. Spoiler. All right, so in the (laughs) quarterfinals, you had Fusion University 3-2. Which, honestly, Fusion University should have lost. In my mind. I, I did watch that. Fusion That was not a pretty game for Fusion. Uh, and the next one, second win, defeated First Gen, 3-2. Uh, and then XL2 Academy defeated Uprising Academy, 3-1. And then Atlanta Academy defeated NRG Esports, 3-1. Which set up the semifinals of Fusion University versus second win. And Fusion won 3 nothing on that one. And then Atlanta Academy uh, defeated XL2 Academy 3-1 to to set up the Fusion Uni versus ATL, or LNL. And Fusion University won that one 4-2. Which so. was not in six maps, as you, know, you might be led to believe, because we did have a draw. Mm-hmm. And which was a pretty spicy two CP match, but you know it's it's assault, so it's two CP. two CP lol. I mean, it, you kind of all come expected, but what you did not come <laughs> to expect, or at least in Atlanta's case, or maybe they should have after the first attack, was Snillo on Ash because oof, mm-hmm. that was, uh, that was something. But you know, a lot of that was just due to the fact that uh, Hawk was just like, yeah, I'm just gonna leave him be, you know. We'll we'll we'll, fig- we'll figure it out. No, we're fine. We're fine. We'll just we'll we'll, we'll be okay. No, 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 no. no. We're, we're just gonna let him. You know, he's, he's not doing anything. Yeah, anymore. I I can only imagine how much yelling there was on comms from Dogman on Hanamura. <laughs> like it happened again. <laughs> <laughs> Damn it. Uh, but anyways, I, I'm not gonna do like a full map by map breakdown. But I will say is you know Legion Tower is what we opened up on, and just right out of the gate. Fusion University intercept Atlanta's rotation, just completely caught him off guard. And of course, with that quick fight, you know, we had the early shatter advantage for Chainzik. And before you know it, Fusion already had 50% on the point. Uh, but Atlanta, you know, they would come back when Gator caught uh, Nice with the shatter. Uh, basically, we, got, we saw Sugar Free come in, he knocked Chainzik off of the map, and they had a pretty good stagger on Alarm. And then, you know, we see Sugar Free basically getting caught out of position. He was a little bit too far forward. Snillo took him out on the Brigida. Uh, Dogman, uh, you know, I'm trying to think. Was it? No. Uh, we saw, like, a late Garbaton Surge coming on, and Fusion ended up flipping the point. And ATL are just held away with the grab at the end. So basically, like, Dogman, before that fight, popped the Transcendence late, 
And then you had, uh, you know, Fusion University, they were holding on to the grab, so they knew that there was no way that Atlanta could even reach the point. So, you know, that was just a an ill timing by Dog Man, unfortunately. And then on the second round, uh, we saw Atlanta take the early point control as nice was on the Pharah. You know, he's just trying to land as much, you know, rocket damage as he can, trying to get that early barrage. And Atlanta got to the Graviton first, but they ended up wasting a self-destruct as they were looking to clean up the last remaining members of Fusion. And Gator on, on this round came in pretty big with his Earth Shatter, but unfortunately, uh, you know, not everything went in their favor. So at one point we saw Grabs coming out from both sides. Uh, really, neither of them really got a lot of value, but when Saucy... Uh, you know, sent his grab out. Alarm actually came in with his transcendence, uh, so that allowed Fusion to flip the point. And, you know, Chainzik is there looking to just, you know, deny the entry uh, at this point. You know, there, there was a moment where Atlanta ended up using two ultimates in what would be a lost fight. And Sugar Free is basically in position trying to, you know, do the shield best to, uh, to set up the Earth Shatter. And then Bernard just comes in over the top, Clutch moment, turns the fight for the fusion. I have to say it like Bernard across his series. Like, if you want to talk about clutch plays for Fusion Uni, Bernard was the guy to always come through. And, you know, of course, we come to expect it from Alarm, because he definitely had his pop-up moments too. But all in all, like Fusion, you know, they were very aggressive early on. They were catching Atlanta off guard. And Atlanta just didn't really know uh how to engage, you know, they, every time they try to wrap around, they would basically get intercepted, and they would just get, they would get halted at that point, so anytime they would try to get into, uh, you know, that white room, as they called it, you know, they, uh, Fusion University was just there to block it, you know, tank alts at the ready, so they didn't really have a clean engage at all in that second round. Yeah, it's, I mean, yeah, it's, there was a, I think the thing that stuck out the most for me for, I mean, in this one, kind of overall, like, the overall big picture, Atlanta just seemed ill-prepared. Um, They just, they didn't seem all there. They didn't seem, like, there's something to be said about Fusion University and their coaching being like, okay, we've been here before. We know this. Mm -hmm. We've been in this big situation. Atlanta Academy is like, this is our first year in contenders as, like, uh, you know, as a expand as a team like a OWL team and it just it it kind of showed that they were just like sloppy play there's right. like you had mentioned bad alt usage like gator was gator is one of those going to be one of those characters in the Overwatch League that is the best to watch and the most infuriating person to ever watch like you're just you're going to hate him 90% of the time but he's going to be the your favorite person 10% of the time. And it's just, the Atlanta team is good. They lost one game to the team that nobody has ever beaten. Like, I mean, plain and simple. Like, nobody's truly beaten Philadelphia, uh, the Fusion unit. So, it, the it, inexperience of Atlanta showed in this match. Um, and it sucks. But, you know, Sugar Free is going to be back for the next five years. Um, hopefully I'm not baguettes. We can only hope. Mm-hmm. Oh, man. But that would lead into the second map, which was Hanamur. And this was the one that ended in a draw. But what I have to say is, you know, we, we got to see the bunker defense from Atlanta. You know, they brought out the Bastion. They brought out the May. They had Anna, uh, Zenyatta, which is really hard to break through. Uh, so, you know, we, we have... You know, Fusion coming out, uh, they were running goats initially, they scouted what Atlanta was running, and they go to full dive. So there you go, there's a variation, we finally got something that wasn't goats. Uh -huh. And go figure out what happened on 2CP. So you have Chainzik, who is on the wrecking ball, he just, you know, rolls around, goes straight to the point, looking to draw Atlanta away. And Fusion are actually able to secure two ticks without really any work being done. You know, Elk mm -hmm. is still kind of, like, at the choke, trying to snipe away. Uh, and Chainzik is just securing, you know, what he can. And 
Uh, Atlanta looked to rotate to the point, and then we see the EMP, the Nanoblade coming out, and that basically ensures easy cleanup for them to take point A. So this is kind of like the question mark for Atlanta, because Sugar Free, you know, normally he's on Burrita. Does he stick with the May? He does. So he's looking to isolate Fusion, and Fusion, for a couple of minutes, really did not know... Uh, you know, how, how to get set up. Every time they would look to engage, someone gets split off. Uh, we saw the wall sitting up Primal Rages. We saw it isolated Bernard. There, there was a point where, you know, Bernard gets demeched and he's trying to run away and jump off the point. But, like, you see Sugar Free just behind him, just trying to freeze him. Just, like, spraying very little to, to slowly freeze him. And eventually, you know, they tried to go for a sleep dart, but uh, Bernard was too low and he ended up getting killed in that moment. Uh, but it was still a very good stagger. But Alarm is really the one who comes out absolutely fragging in OT. And that, that really opened it back up. Uh, Bernard got back into his mech, which resulted in a kill for Fusion University, which was pretty cool. We don't really get to see <laughs> remech kills all that often. Uh, and, you know, Fusion, they lucked out. They completed the map in OT. And then... Fusion's defense came out, right? They had they kept the May, and then they moved Snillo over to the Ash. And, you know, Dogman comes in, gets picked off. <laughs> right away. So, feels bad man moment there. Uh, basically just got isolated and ate, like, three consecutive shots. He saw lead in front of the game. Back to the spawn. You know, the, the dog pound, you know. I mean, heck, we even had an episode... Related to that ex very exact thing. <laughs> and it definitely felt like that again on Hanamura. Uh, but, you know, th there was another funny moment, too, where... Uh, i trying to remember if it was on... Yeah, it was on this map, too, where uh, I believe it was Gator ends up getting slept. And then we see, like, the, the ice wall, like, shoot up and then the charge. I can't remember what side did it, but I know it was on that map. Uh, but Elk on Hanamura, you know, playing the Ana, always comes in big because of the, the the sight lines in that map. At one point, he catches Gator with a big sleep dart, and it really just opens everything up for Fusion at that point. You know, eventually, uh, Saucy ends up just microwaving everyone, putting it that on full display, just cuts through Fusion, and they slow play it. They ended up blocking Chainsick Shatter, and they finish the map with just under two minutes. So when we talk about the time bank, really no changes out from Fusion University. Snillo still on the ash. Dogman comes in, gets caught on the rotation yet again. And at that point, it's just like, he's like, you know what? I just can't risk it. Like, Zenyatta, he's too slow. I'm not going to be able to survive. So he swaps over to the Moira. He's like, maybe, you know, maybe I'll just fade straight to the point and I just won't deal with it. And then... You know, Atlanta are just like, all right, well, uh, we're just going to ignore Snillo under absolutely <laughs> no pressure at all. He earns Bob. Bob does something. You know, he, he actually went out. He was yep. landing shots. He was doing good. Uh, you know, on the fusion attack, you know, he didn't really do all that much. But here he made up for it. So Bob was, you know, 50 percent effective in this case. Which is still probably a better percentage than our Bob, but that's besides the point. <laughs> uh, but, you know, Fusion ended up getting the full hold to to force the draw. Yeah. Uh, one thing I will point out on this, and there's a really cool play seen a couple of times by Snillo on the Ash, um, is Snillo jumped uh, on defense, point eight, obviously. He jumped off the back. Mm -hmm. And then. I don't know if it was on purpose or because he was backing up when he went off the back because he was trying to, he threw the his dynamite on point. So he was backing up the back. He went off the back and then he had enough wherewithal to sh like to rocket like whatever you want to, I forget the name of the actual ability, but like, you know, the little mini shotgun that shoots you back. Right. Shoot it down in the air as he's falling to pr propel himself back up onto the map. And then he lands and gets two kills. Mm -hmm. I'm like, okay, yeah, no, you are you are way better, way better Ash than I could ever be. Um, but it was it was interesting. Uh, another thing, I think on this one, Ajax, Ajax is on Lucio, and I may have my maps mix, max, eh. I may have my maps mixed up, um, but Ajax. <sighs> 
his ultimates. And I've seen this on Reddit, and I know I've called Reddit accessible, but sometimes they have good points. He had three. He had three beats interrupted, and I think one of them was on Hanamura. Um, that's a lot of ultimates wasted as Lucio. Um, so yeah, it's just like the superior play of Fusion again sticks out on this, and the inexperience of Atlanta Academy, thinking that they can just use sure talent because like in my mind i actually think atlanta and fusion university are very similar talent wise but atlanta is more of a we're going to use our talent to bully people and fusion's more of a we're going to use our talent to work together and i think that's where their downfall was and i think this map also kind of shows it you know like you said they just you know hawk just let Snello chill on the on the ash and not do anything. And Dogman's like, I hate you. Go to hell. Uh, he's just destroying me. But, like, nobody took care of the ash when, you know, Hawk as D.Va could easily go back and, and deal with ash. Like, so it's just, yeah, it's just the inconsistencies. And then, you know, they, like you said, they did the full hold to force the tie which was nice yeah so i, I don't want to spend too much more time on this just because we still have quite a bit else to cover um, <laughs> but we did go to route 66 which would go in atlanta's favor uh that one was also a time bank attack and then busant had been there was a clean 2-0 victory for fusion uh but yes like there there was a point where ajax just could not drop the beat he tried three times so he dropped yeah, the he, beat. He, he he dropped just without. He didn't drop the beat though. He just dropped. He dropped, dropped the beat. Maybe maybe he dropped to a different kind of beat. He dropped the show tune. It might have been. I I don't know. You I mean, there's any number of ways you can do it. But you know, there there was some. Um, uh, I mean, I don't want to condone Twitch chat spam because of uh, the way they went about doing it because it had to do with kind of a uh, uh, abuse. And we're not doing that. Wait, uh, Twitch chat was toxic? Yes, Twitch no, chat was extremely toxic. Never. Never I know, imagine perfect that. Perfect human beings of all time. But anyways, so Busan was just a series of unfortunate events for Atlanta Academy. And then after that, we went to Hollywood, we went to Dorado, and Atlanta just got full held. Mm -hmm. Like... When, when we talk about Fusion University, this is a team who is proven on LAN. They have a knack for going deep into series and always coming out on top. And lo and behold, it happened yet again. So at the end of the day, when it comes to the differences between these two teams, you have to think of, well, what was the state of Atlanta Academy after that crushing defeat on Busan? Now, you know, it was just tied up. And then... Busan was just this absolute train wreck of a map, and they just looked so deflated after that to the point where, you know, this is where that mental fortitude ultimately came into play in this series. They just collapsed. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I had to say, too, like, when you look back at Hanamura, too, for, uh, for Fusion to somehow clutch out uh, and, you know, escape with a draw... You know, when, you know, that was a really easy win condition for Atlanta. Uh, and then, you know, just the unfortunate events that happened on Busan. Like, the momentum was so drastic of a change that there was really nothing Atlanta could do at that point. Especially when you add on to the fact that you have Fusion having so much poise that, you know, this isn't anything out of the ordinary for them. And for them to become back-to-back-to-back -to -back -to -back champs regardless of roster changes, is an absolute monster win, not only for them uh, and their org, but their players as well. And it just comes to show, like, you know, their coaching staff has moved around quite a bit. I would not be surprised if the same thing ends up happening yet again. But, you know, Atlanta, you know, overall, like, that was definitely the closest grand finals we have had in NA. But when it got to the championship rounds, they got knocked out. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Um, I, and you would know this more than me. Has Alarm and Elk been the healers for Fusion mm -hmm. since day one? Yeah. Hmm. So 
Okay. They're the they're the constant. Imagine that. Weird. Weird. Like I mean that says a lot though. Like when you have like they basically I think I don't want to say I mean they're the two they're the two people that carry the team. Mm-hmm. Alarm and elk. I don't think anyone's really gonna dispute that because they're the only constant on the three championship teams except maybe Bernard Bernard may have been on all three I don't know um but like I I, I just don't know like as soon as they lose Elk and Alarm that's when you're gonna start seeing them probably crumble um and start to really kind of fall down but you know I mean they're losing Elk to uh Fusion because he's on a two-way contract, but then they sign Car Car, mm-hmm. so now you have Car Car and Alarm, and you're like, shit, crap. Sorry, mark that down. Um, <laughs> yeah, I mean you have Car Car replacing Elk to play with Alarm, and then man, they're just they're just destroying us. So like, it's it's amazing the way that they kind of just, hey, we're gonna get rid of you know the best DPS duo in NA, and we're still gonna destroy you. Like, oh, we lost Beast Halo. Okay, that's fine. We're we're still gonna destroy you, and then, yeah, it's their titles to lose at this point. So, mm-hmm. hopefully, hopefully they lose. I don't want to see a four peat. That's boring. Well, I mean, it was also the first three peat, yeah. which well, it's is gonna be short lived though. When you figure that you know another team is gonna do it here very shortly, that in uh, Base Try Hearts when Brazil Game and House three peats in South America. I feel that's a little different. Just just a tad bit. This is true. It's a smaller region. I mean, what, smaller region, what, about, less what, competition. what about the Australia? Aren't they... It's a team that drop bears? To be fair, I've not been keeping up with AU as much this season. I will look it up really... They're still in it. Uh, the semifinals are in a day and 21 hours. Wouldn't, that, wouldn't they be a three-peat They too? would also be a three-peat if they win. I so feel there, this there's is There's a lot of play. And, like, Runaways are on a, a two-peat, right? Because they won if, last. If they win, yeah. Oh, I thought they did win. They're in the finals. Oh, they're, they're, they'll probably win. Um, so they would be on a two-peat. I feel they need to change things up. The only thing that's really screwing everything up is EU. Yeah, well, that's because of how close that region is. But anyways, so... The big question is, okay, well, what's going to happen to some of these other contenders teams? Because, you know, there's a lot of talk about, uh, you know, contend- the affiliate teams getting an automatic, uh, you know, spot in Season 1 of 2019. And, you know, you had teams like Second Wind, First Generation, that did really damn good. Uh, well, Second Wind and First Gen have both been invited back for Season 1 of 2019, so they're not getting relegated, they don't have to re-qualify or anything like that, so that is awesome. I'm happy for that. Especially since, you know, Second Wind really was the surprise team of the season, and First Gen, you know, granted this is a former GOATS team, but, you know, they've still uh, had very strong performances across the season, and... Yeah, we, we have more Tier 2 competition on the way here uh, this weekend, actually, mm-hmm. with Jane's Tournament of Future Champions. So this will have top teams from both North America and Europe. And this is the first time that the Future Champions Tournament is going to introduce not only hero bans, but hero protects. So I'm really anxious to see how people are going to be working this. So, you know, that could uh, potentially even out... You know, the playing field here, depending on uh, if people have just set strats uh, regarding that. So, this tournament will also allow coaches to spectate matches. So, I know they've been doing, like, qualifiers for both NA and EU. So, out of the confirmed teams uh, who don't have to qualify for NA, we have First Generation. We have Path of Poverty, Chicken Contendies, Who, and uh, Mirage. And then for EU, we have One Point. Young and Beautiful, Shoes Money Crew EU, HSL Esports, Falafel Avengers Partners, <laughs> Top Dogs, and Novus Ordo Seclorum. Uh, so this is all going to be a knockout type bracket. We'll have NA on January 19th at 3pm Pacific Time. 
And then EU will be held January 20th, starting at 9 a.m. Pacific Time. Of course, all this will be streamed live on Jane's Twitch channel. Uh, he'll be casting it alongside Lemon Kiwi yet again. Uh, and Labosco, or Labosco will also be part of that crew. So, you know, this is uh, a good opportunity. You know, Blizzard might not be testing hero bands per se, but we get to see how it might, uh, you know, come into play when it comes to the competitive scene. So I'm really excited to see how exactly this is going to go down. I encourage you all to check it out. And, you know, it's always good to support the Tier 2, Tier 3 scene as well. Uh, yeah, I mean, yes, it is really cool. One thing I wish they would not do is allow contenders teams in. Like, I, I'm, I'm sorry, like, but first gen is going to win. More than likely, I'm not guaranteeing it, but first gen is probably going to win the NA thing. Like, it's just, you have that one dominant team in there. I don't, I feel they should not invite contenders teams. That's that's just me, because it gives people uh, more of a. I mean, you get to see more people that you're just not used to, seeing in less dominant fashions. Because I think anyone who's a betting person is probably betting on first gen to win this all. Or I mean, Young and the Beautiful, yes. EU contenders team, but you know, they're still in contenders and they qualified for contenders. Like, they're probably one of the best EU teams. Like, so, it, you know, I, I that's the only knock I have on this. But I'm, I'm kind of excited to see the Hero Protect over the Hero ban. Because, I mean, I don't know if they talk about it, but which comes first? Like, do they pick a Hero to ban first? I would imagine and, it would be ban. So, like, you ban first and then you can protect someone? I'm not sure. Or did, yeah, see, like, or they could protect and be like, Diva, and be like, ah, crap, I got Banner. Like, you know, it, so it, it will be interesting to see what order that comes in, because that actually makes a pretty, you know, a pretty big change, because you can change who you're going to ban based on who they keep. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, it will be interesting. And uh, I was hinting at this earlier, but we are going to see more competition in the uh, the Path to Pro. You know, a lot of people have been up in arms about the lack of LAN in playoffs this past season. Well, we got some new events for LAN in 2019, and I am really excited about this. So we have, you know, all eight regions of contenders participated in interregional events called showdown matches. So these showdowns will use a double elimination sub bracket, and the teams that perform best in showdown will earn spots to compete in a contender's gauntlet event later in the year. So in regards to showdown, we have uh, the divisions, or we got regions divided into two divisions. You have the Atlantic, you have the Pacific, and we have uh, this all going down in the mid-year break for the Overwatch League. So something to watch when there's nothing to watch. Fantastic. Mm -hmm. I love when that happens. Uh, so for the Pacific Showdown, this will be held in May 24th through the 26th, and this will be held in China. So you'll have teams from China, Australia, Korea, and Pacific. So the way that they broke it down is you'll have one team from Australia, you know, who will be the top team, uh, the top team from Pacific, the top two from China, top two from Korea, and then for Atlantic... That will be May 31st through June 2nd. Uh, no word on whether it's going to be held in Europe or NA. But you'll have two teams from Europe, three teams from North America, and then the top team, base tryhards. I mean, let's be real. Yeah. Probably going to yeah, happen let's again. Let's be realistic here. Uh, you know, they'll be invited uh, to represent South America. Mm -hmm. And then at the end of all of this, we have the Gauntlet, which will be held October 10th through the 13th, and invites will be determined by the performances in the showdowns. So the Gauntlet details are pretty scarce, but this is going to be held after the conclusion of Overwatch League's 2019 season. But, you know, we've always kind of, you know, thought about, like, well, okay, well, like, we've seen, like, maybe, like, one champion versus another champion, but we never get to see that international type competition across the globe, and we're finally going to get a taste of it. So, from 
you know, a competition standpoint, it kind of uh, helps separate the regions in the sense of, you know, where people might rank them. And then for some of these lesser uh, represented regions, you know, like Australia, like South America, it gives them another land opportunity. It gets them more exposure. It's a win-win. And who knows, like, maybe China... Is going to throw something completely off kilter that's going to throw people off like they did in the World Cup. But this is going to answer a lot of these unknown uh, questions that we have about some of these top teams in each region. And I cannot wait to see what these showdowns are going to offer. And, uh, you know, like, just based on how everything is... You know, it's, it's so hard to say, like, who I would favor. Obviously, you know, Korea... Is probably you know going to be the top of the Pacific, mm-hmm. uh, but Atlanta Atlantic is really the question mark because you know EU has always been pretty strong. They've always fared pretty well against NA, but I, with the lack of land events in South America, it's a big unknown factor. So I I, I don't know what to expect from that one in particular. But I am super pumped for interregional competition, and I know a lot of people are excited about this. Yeah. Now, one thing that actually I, uh, I'm wondering, and I don't know if we'll ever actually see what actually happens from this, is so you're you're getting a lot of these team teams from the Pacific, from Australia, from Brazil, or sorry, you know, South America, Brazil. Um, they don't have the financial backing that North America and EU have, and Korea has, and China has. They just, they just don't have the financial back. You know, they get paid for winning their contenders team in Blizzard Bucks. Mm-hmm. Like, so how can a team from South America, like the Brazil Gaming House, send their whole team to Europe to play? Like, you know what I mean? Will Blizzard step in and be like, and pay for any of this? I, or... I would assume so, like... But, like, that's the thing, is, like, if they pay for them, are they going to be who have no problem with money and backing and stuff like that? It's it's just, it's one of those things. We won't we won't actually find out how. They'll just get there. So every um, everyone but Academy teams gets flown out, you know, everything handled by Blizzard. Yeah, I'm guessing the Atlantic uh, showdown is going to be in Europe. And then the gauntlet will be in the U.S. Because that's where, as much as it's a career de- career-defined sport, <laughs> eSport, like, it is. It's Their main market is going to be the, the NA. Mm-hmm. So I can have see them doing some sort of big event in NA where they bring in the, you know, top two Korean teams... Or, like, top three from the Pacific, top three from the Atlantic, where the winners of each get a bye. And then the other two teams play each other. You know, and, and something like that. Do do just, like, a, a six-person tournament. And, um, yeah, like, do something like that. But maybe not at Blizzard headquarters or the Overwatch League stadium. They could do something in, you know, Dallas or New York or you know, Atlanta, so, somewhere they could do it. But I, I feel the gauntlet will be in uh, North America. Well, we do have one more uh, news bit out of the Overwatch League, and that is that uh, Jundu were, you know, on the free agency hunt, and they have turned to former Miraculous Youngster and Team CC main tank Gigi Ren to add more depth to their roster. So GG Ren played for MY when they were the strongest team in China. That was back in 2017. And, you know, like some of the other MY players, he would leave competitive Overwatch play. But unlike some of these players who are also on uh, Chengdu, uh, he would actually, you know, shortly after, you know, a couple of months, he actually got signed to Shanghai Dragons Academy team, that being Team CC. And he was with them all three seasons of contenders in 2018. So, GG Ren marks the third player signed from MY. So, he will be reunited under head coach RUI. And he's the 10th player to join the Hunters roster, who opened up the season against the Guangzhou Charge on February 15th. 
So, this is the second main tank for the Hunters. Are you imagining that Jichi Ren is going to start over uh, Amen on main tank just due to the fact that he already has this pre-existing synergy with Late Yun, who was no. also on CC, or are you expecting it the other way? I'm expecting Amen to, to, to still be the, the, the main tank on this team. Um, and part of it is, if they really were that high on him, they would have already signed him. Mm-hmm. Because there was nothing stopping them from signing him. Really, there wasn't. If they really wanted him as their main tank and to be a focal point of that team, because, you know, a main tank is a focal point of a team, then they, yeah, he would have been on the team. He would have been practicing with the team. He would have been doing all that stuff. And he's just not doing that, you know. And I mean, obviously, now he is, but he's a backup tank. He, from the, I, I've seen clips, I've seen, a couple matches. Um, he's not super impressive. Uh, so, like, I'm not... I don't know. I'm not sold on him as being, like, a starting main tank. All right. Fair enough. Know, what do, you, do you think he's going to start over? You know, it's so hard to say because, like, it's such a late addition. I don't really know, like, how deep into scrims this team is. Mm-hmm. You know, that's really the big unknown. Like, if they're already kind of, like, situated... Like, I, I can imagine that GG Ren is still going to serve as, like, the backup. But, you know, if things don't work out at the start, you know, maybe we would see a quick flip. I don't I don't know. It's, it's kind of hard to say. Uh, but, you know, having a backup is always handy. You know, maybe one of them will be, you know, the Janus of the team. And they'll come in on maps where they won't matter. But then again, it's an expansion team. So probably all of the maps are going to matter. Probably. <sighs> but, I mean, I guess we'll get an idea when the preseason happen oh wait no never mind yeah the preseason of t- of two days of actual match yeah awkward sorry a little better jesus people honk their horn that i'm sure that got picked up on my mic but anyways this will lead into our main discussion for tonight which will be our continuation of our overwatch league season two host ranks here on heroes never die so we'll start from number 15 and we'll merc Work our way up to that number 11 slot. So, Ed, why don't you start us off? Who do you have in that 15th slot? I have what the majority of us have in the Guanzo charge. Um, I, I I feel this is the one team at the bottom or towards the bottom that could shock us mm-hmm. uh, and be like a top eight team. I, I mean, I don't think they're there yet, but I think they could be. They have, they just have one of those unique teams that you're... I don't know what the hell they were doing when they put a team together. You know, like, you have Kib uh, from, you know, the UK. You have Nero from the US. You have Eileen from China. Like, you have Hotba from Korea. Like, it's just they have a ragtag team, and you just don't know how they're going to act. And how they're going to play together. And, I, you know, it, it's going to be interesting to see what they do. But I have them at 15 because I don't think that they're going to be that dominant, at least from the get-go. Because they may not... There's a, definitely going to be a language barrier mm-hmm. in a team like this. And you don't know how well they're going to work together like that. So, that's, I have them at 15. Who do you have? Uh, for myself, I have the Paris Eternal. Uh, so for for me, Paris is kind of interesting because you you have Soon, obviously, who is probably the biggest sign in uh, mm-hmm. to most people. Uh, you know, I'm a huge Cruise fanboy, so I'm gonna I'm gonna let, you know put my foot down on that. The Cruise was the bigger sign in uh, just due to his prowess and. Just how important support backlines have been to really open up the shatters and whatnot, which we've seen time and time again. Because, uh, you know, a lot of these Ryans would not be hitting the shatters if it weren't for, you know, boops or shield bashes, all of that good stuff. But anyway, so you have Soon, you have Shadowburn, so, you know, you have that DPS line who have been in the Overwatch League. And for Shadowburn, like, I feel like this is a bigger opportunity for him because, you know, he had EQO on the Fusion, and EQO basically came out... And he never lost his grip on that DPS slot. 
Like, as soon as EQO performed, that was it for Shadowburn. So there's a lot of question mark kind of revolving around, well, how good is Shadowburn really? Like, how how is this, like, lawn lay layover going to affect his mentality? Uh, is he still going to be able to perform like we expect him to on LAN? I don't know, but I'm really excited for Donye. I'm just worried that he's not going to see a ton of play. Uh, but, you know, ne Nico's another question mark, too, because, like, he's flexed so much in the past. Like, we've been used to seeing him playing, like, Diva in Contenders uh, with Eagle Gaming. So, like, I, I, I don't know about that. But, you know, Cruz, I'm a huge fan of. But the, the tank line is kind of the thing that's going to make or break this team. There have been times where LH Cloudy has looked phenomenal. There's been times where Ben Best uh, has looked pretty good. And then other times where he's looked kind of out of his element. But, like, he is an experienced main tank. And then Finzi is kind of the wild card of this team, primarily just due to the fact that uh, he, he rode the bench throughout Season 1 on the LA Valiant. So I, I don't have the most confidence in this tank line as opposed to some of the other tank lines out there. And I feel like that is ultimately what puts him a little bit lower in, in my retrospect. Uh, but I actually had the Guanjo charge at 14, uh, so I might as well transition to that. So yeah. th this is one of those teams where a lot of us feel like, okay, like we're not going to base it only off of, uh, you know, the show match, you know, the Pacific showdown. But what I will say about the showdown is we saw most of the pieces in play. It's pretty evident that their communication is a work in progress, which we all expected just due to how international of a roster this is. But this team could be the next Philadelphia Fusion for all we know. Like, they had a very similar, you know, Frankenstein-type roster, all these different countries on one team, and... You know, Philly really knocked it out of the park last year. You know, they had some pretty deep runs in playoffs. And I feel like the skill potential of this team vastly outpaces some of the other expansion teams that are on the lower end of the run. Probably even more so than some of the teams that I might have higher. But initially, like, I feel like this is going to be a slower team out of the gates. But... For Hotpa's sake, you know, I, I just hope that maybe maybe we'll see the return of the Pocket Tracer in Season 2. Because whenever, whenever Hotpa was on Tracer, like, he just took matters into his own hand, which you just never expect from a tank playing a different role. Yeah. No, I mean, I get that. It's, just, like I said, they're the one team that could really do something different. Mm -hmm. And I think... They're also one of the teams that are going to be meta specific. Right. Like they could be a Dallas Fuel, they could be a Boston Uprising, where if the meta fits their team that well, they could dominate. But I don't think they're there yet. So, uh, so you had them them at fourteen. I actually had Atlanta Rain at fourteen. Um, this team was probably the Atlanta Rain was probably the team I had to, to place because I could have put them at 20th I could have put them at six like it, it all on it all depends on how you feel about them. like obviously everyone knows about them, um and how great of a, a player he is I, I he's a great player I'm not going to deny any of that I don't know how reliable he is as a player uh, he has to prove himself to me as a player before I can actually trust him. I think the reason I have them at 14 and not actually lower than that is for their tank line, actually. And I'm not even talking Gator. Uh, I'm talking Daco and Popo. Can I'm bad at the name. But, uh, you know, anytime you have two... X runaway tanks. They played on runaway. You sure about that one, Chief? Uh, um, according to. Oh no, they played it's runaway. Element. Dang it's it! It's Element Mystic. Oh, it's Element Mystic. All right, so then I should have put them. I totally thought they were both on runaways, but they played runaways. 
Wow. I, I love that you one. keep saying runaways. Eh, whatever. <laughs> um, yeah, never mind. Um, but th- I think the star of this team actually, personally, uh, he kind of shined a little bit. He was a player from Germany that kind of shined for them in the Overwatch World Cup. Mm-hmm. Um, so I do like Kodak a lot. Again, this is also a ragtag team. Like, it's, you know, they have everything from DeFran to, so they have Koreans, Americans, Germans, you know, Denmark, what is it, Finland. Like, they just have people from all over the place. So it's going to be a communication thing as well with this team, as well as you may be out of your out your best player. Like, you may be without DeFran for hopefully a while because I feel he needs to be suspended. Uh, I haven't kept that quiet <laughs> about my feelings about him. But, you know, Gator is another person who is just like hit or miss. I talked about it earlier. He's going to be someone you're going to love, you're going to hate. Uh, you have Kodak, who I think is reliable. Masa, I don't really know much about Masa as the support player, though. Um, I know he played on... Did he play on the British Hurricane? Was he one of them on the British Hurricane? You know, I'm trying... I, I... I th- I want to say he was on Giganti, but I'm not. It was Giganti. Um, okay. Yeah, he was on Giganti. Mm-hmm. I I thought for some reason he was on British, but like I mean he, they did well when he was uh, on Giganti and Contenders, but like I just don't know anything about him. So this is gonna be a team that again like the Guangzhou Charge that could be dead last, could be top eight. Mm-hmm. And we just don't know. Yeah, I actually have Atlanta Rain at 13. So, DPS-wise, zero concerns. Uh, I know... If they're all playing. Even if the friend doesn't play, like, I know in Lair is an absolute monster. Airster has looked really good. Uh, I mean, the friend, you know, you can say what you will about his mentality and, you know, whether or not he's going to play, you know, how much he's throwing games on stream, all that good stuff. Uh, but at th- what what I like about this team, not not just including the team, uh, but the people around the team, like behind the scenes, their staff on this team is ridiculous. <laughs> you know, there's a lot of strong pieces that are going to be supporting this team on the mm-hmm. coaching staff behind the scenes, and I'm looking forward to it. Uh, you know, Daco, Gator, and Pokepo. Uh, you know, it's it's really hard to tell, like. Well, is Gator going to be playing main tank when Reinhardt is needed? Uh, is Daco going to play that role? I would imagine that they're going to stick with the synergy of the front line. So, I I don't know. I, I have a feeling like Gator... Here's what I say. Gator on Atlanta Academy. It's Gator and Sugar Free setting up the vast majority of the opportunities for Atlanta whenever they're playing. Mm-hmm. Uh, but then again, you know, you brought up Gator's playstyle, and to an extent, I agree. So, Gator, I'll give you some examples. There are times where Gator does the, the no-look shatter. Sometimes it pays off massive. Sometimes it hits a shield. Mm-hmm. Then, then he does uh, uh, the 180 shatter. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> kind of the same thing. And then, you know, he also kind of does the aggressive charges, which is another hit or miss thing. Sometimes he gets punished. Sometimes he doesn't. Sometimes he gets the pick. Whatever. Uh, But he's a person that lives by the sword and then also dies by the sword. So you got to take it for what it's worth. Uh, But Daco and Pokebo, when you look back at Element Element Mystic, this is a team who had a lot of young talent, uh, a lot of seasoned talent that over time really came into their own and were making deep runs in contenders. And we've seen other pieces get picked apart from that team. And... You know, I I feel like with the opportunities that they are going to provide that DPS lineup, it really kind of shores up, you know, some of the some of the naysayers out there. I feel like the DPS line isn't going to be in the question at all. They're going to have they're going to have the space to work with. They're going to pop off. So I, I feel like the holes in this team aren't as evident as some of the other teams. And that's why I have them at 13. So I'm excited. I'm looking forward to it. Whether or not Slambo is actually affiliated with it, despite, you know, 
uh, his company being an investor. Uh, but uh, this is one of those teams that, you know, a lot of people are going to be a fan of them just based off of DeFran. But I can promise you by the end of the season that the other members of the DPS line, Airster and Lair, I don't know if they'll be household names, but they'll definitely be in the run-in for potentially Rookie of the Year. Yep. Uh, so uh, a 13, for so you had them for 13 for me, I had the Cox of the Walk, the Paris mm-hmm. Eternal. Um, you know, we kind of had the same 13, 14, 15. We did. Um, I... You you spoke about the one person who's the one of my biggest sleepers going into season two, uh, and that's Danye. Um, I fell in love with Danye in the World Cup. Uh, Danye was ridiculously good in the World Cup. Uh, I, unfortunately, he was on Team Poland, and Team Poland as a whole are not a good team. I actually predict that Danye will be at the starting DPS. Um, I don't feel Shadowburn is going to keep his spot. Like Shadowburn is probably going to stay, start the the like start the season as a starter. But I feel Danny is going to outperform him. Okay. Um, now, like you said, the the strong suits obviously DPS line. You, when you have soon Shadowburn Danny as your three DPS, you're golden. Like you're doing nothing wrong. Um. Their support line of, I mean, I am a massive fan of Cruz as well. Um, you know, when he was on Toronto Esports, that mm-hmm. he was so good. Uh, I really like Hype. Um, the the a little bit I've seen Hype play. I don't know. Uh, Hype, I'm assuming, is the other starting support player over Gray. Yes. Uh, I I mean, I'm not going to say for certain yet because like, I don't know much about Gray, but. You know, when you're the, you know, the Zenyatta player for the number one, you know, contenders team for like two years running, you know, two seasons running in Eagle Gaming, like you're, you're doing something right. Um, so you have them, but that tank line, that's a boomer bust. They mm-hmm. could surprise. They, I, I will not doubt that they could surprise us and be a dominant tank line. But more than likely, that's not going to be pretty. Uh, Finzi, I think they could find a definite upgrade for Finzi over Finzi out there. But they went with the pure European team. So mm-hmm. they it was fairly limited to what D.Va players were available for them. Besides all of EU contenders. Just saying. But um, Finzi brings the experience. Like, yes, he rolled the pine for the Valiant, but he rolled the pine in the pros. So he brings the experience with him. Uh, you know, Ben Bess, I think, will probably be the starting main tank. Um, but I, I, I feel him and Cloudy are going to probably rotate out a lot of maps depending on who's better on what hero for that specific. But... Yeah, I, I mean, I like the Paris Eternal, uh, minus their logo. But they have a solid team. They do have a team. And, you know, if they had a better tank line, they would be up in the Hanzo Vancouver talk. But, I mean, they just don't. So, um, let's see, 12. I think we both had the same for 12. We do. And uh, at 12, I have... We all both have. We have the Houston Outlaws. Um, I, I mean, I'm just going to say this now. Houston was not that impressive at the end of season. They just weren't. Season, uh, stage three, stage four, they were just that impressive. Um, they have. Uh, Muma's a good tank. I like Muma as a tank. Um, I like Cool Nat uh, and Spree. I think they're good, you know, flex tanks. Um, I don't love their DPS line. I'm I'm just gonna say that I like Links, but I think Linkser is a more specialized DPS mm-hmm. than the cornerstone of your DPS. Jake, I don't think Jake is destined to stay in the league as a player. I've said this numerous mm-hmm. times, 
Jake is not destined to stay in this league. This will be his last season in, in the Overwatch League. And then he'll move into a more ambassador role, uh, an announcer role with the league. I think they're already kind of moving towards that. So that's, I mean, that's why they went out and got Dante. And Dante is their starting overlinker outside out of Widowmaker. I think Dante is their star DPS player. Um, so you're looking at Linkser and Dante, two DPS players, which isn't great, but it's not it's not great, but it's not trashed here, but it's middle of the road. Um, Muma and Kumat and Spree and, and that whole tank situation, they can make it work. I don't think they're going to be as good as they were in Season 1. I do not like their support as much. Um, I think Rockus is very overrated. Rockus is... Here's the thing with Rockus. He is he's a great personality and he's above average at a lot of support players. He's not he's not amazing at any one support player. And I think that that hurts them. Is you know you need somebody that can really come in and be like I'm going to be this you know crazy ridiculous Zenyatta or crazy Lucio or something like that. And Rockus isn't that, but he is above average. So Houston is a team where I I don't know. I just don't see them doing that well. I gave them the 13th, 13th spot out of courtesy for season one. But in my mind, I feel they should have been more. Houston, this ranking was the hardest team for me. Because... I have so many gut feelings about this team that are extremely cruel. <laughs> but then they they also had a pretty... No, granted, they didn't make a lot of moves, okay? They, they only picked up one person, but I really liked who they picked up for what they needed. Mm -hmm. uh, so Dante coming in, getting traded from the San Francisco Shock is good. You know, a lot of people are kind of focusing on, well, ooh, they finally have a Tracer player. I'm aware Dante plays a lot more than just Tracer, guys. Just an FYI. Uh, Sombra. He's you know, real getting, good at Sombra. getting a pretty good buff against armor targets on the P tier. I'm just saying it's like 25% against armor targets. There's probably going to be a lot of fair, a lot of, or a lot of like Sombra dive. Like so Sombra Genji, I'm imagining. It's going to yeah. be gonna be pretty prominent. Uh, yeah, and even in some cases, Sombra Farah, uh, depending on the map. Uh, but a lot of people just focus in on, oh, well. Okay, let me rephrase this. A lot of Outlaws fans were just like, you know what, we just we don't have a Tracer player. That's that's the only problem. No, 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 no. You didn't have a Tracer player and your supports were bad. So, I was watching the Pro Pugs. Uh, Bonnie was getting picked a lot. Yeah? Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, there's the strangest thing that happened. Uh, you know, there was Divas a lot. That wasn't the strange part, uh, but Bonnie, you know, he kind of kind of had an issue with this in uh, in season one, where a diva bomb would come in, and he would die to it. <laughs> Pro pugs, no difference. Yeah. So there's that. Uh, but really, like you know, Rockus has been very hit or miss for me. Uh, I felt like his performance kind of across the board was okay. Uh, out, outside of the Overwatch League, you know, I'm still a fan of him. Uh, you know, he's got a good persona. He's got awesome hair. Good emotes. All that good stuff. Uh, and, but I will say, like, his Zenyatta fluctuates on how good he really is. You know, there's sometimes where he's pretty, pretty good. Other times where he's maybe just average at best. But, you know, a lot of people look at this and everyone hypes up the tank core of Coolmet, of Spree... Of, uh, <clears throat> of Muma, you know, on main tank. And a lot of people look at Spree and he's like, okay, he's he's on King's Row duty. You know, he's he's only going to come in. He's going to play Zarya. And Spree, fantastic Zarya player. Cool Met, cooled off. I'm not sold on Cool Met as much as I was in the past. That was a good one. Uh, <laughs> I gave you on that one. That was a good joke. Uh, Muma, you know, I, I like Muma. He's got great game sense, but... I, I'm not going to hype him up as much as a lot of other, you know, fans will. Like, I, I don't think he's top five at his role. He's good. He's just not at that upper echelon. So, across the board, 
Like, their cores are serviceable. They're not great. Like, there's really, like, no true, like, top prospect or top rank player at any of those roles. And then when you look at the DPS, Dante, awesome pickup. You know, I'm a, I've am been a big fan of Dante, and he, he's really shown his stuff on the shock. Uh, but unfortunately, you know, he was kind of handcuffed to Sinatra. And now Sinatra will get to know how that feels because of uh, Stryker. So that's fantastic. Uh, so he'll get a taste of his own medicine. <laughs> You know, that, that 150k bench is going to come in real handy. Uh, you can buy a really nice pine yeah. bench to sit on in the back. Yeah, maybe maybe get some, like, cushions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He, could, he could get, like, a... Maybe maybe he can get, like, a futon. He'll get a futon and he can just lay down. <laughs> I like it. We could do that, uh, for sure. Uh, but yeah, you have Dante, you have Linkser. Linkser, Widowmaker, fan is fantastic, you know, uh, yep. when it comes to the dueling aspect, you know, he's one of the best in the league. Uh, outside of that Widowmaker play, he falls off a little bit. Mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, outside of that, Arhan, you know, he's he's a bit of a memer. His Genji's decent, not great. Uh, but, you know, he's he's a very experienced player. And Jake, you know, I know, I know we have a lot of Outlaws listeners. I know, you know, Mel, big supporter of the Outlaws. One our of our new, our, our new hosts on our Fantasy Overwatch League. Awkward. Is also a huge Outlaws fan, so, you know, they're just following Blaze Above everywhere and every podcast he goes on. Jake is the most overrated player in the Overwatch League. Yes. Without so. question. I don't even think it's close. Like, he's a great person, great guy. He'll be an awesome uh, players union rep or leader pretty good at casting the despite how green he is at it mm -hmm. but his hero pool is in Tavik territory where he's awesome at Jungrat cannot play any other hero to save his life at at that level that's not to say that he can't play it's just when you compare him to the rest of the field Jake retracts a lot you know and it, it really hurts him. Like, I, I know that Houston, out of all these teams, has a lot of camaraderie. Uh, they're a very tight-knit type family team, and that's great. You know, that can definitely help them out in certain situations. And, you know, Dante's addition is great. But the, the thing that's really going to help the Outlaws at the, at the end of the season is... Whether or not that they can have any sort of adaptability, because that is really what plagued them in season one. If this team can adapt better to the metas, I feel like they will end at this spot. But out of the rankings, at least 15 through 11, Houston is by far the team that I feel like has the most to lose. You know, this is a team that, you know, they might have a strong stage one, and then no one really talks about them the rest of the season. And I'm worried that something similar is going to happen to them again. I hope that's not going to be the case. But the Outlaws, you know, they they stuck to their guns. You know, they only made one addition. Now it's time to see if it bites them in the ass. I feel it's going to. I mean, I know it's going to. <laughs> like, it just is. I, 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 I don't know. I'm, I'm not so at all. Like... I wasn't sold on them in stage three. I wasn't sold on them in stage four. It's just they have they're the fan favorite team, but they don't have the skill to back it up. I, I think that's what it comes down to. They're very adamant fans, like you said, very adamant fans. It's just they don't have the skill to back up being the fan favorites. So mm -hmm. yeah. Um so and, I will let, oh. And I will say my favorite part about the team is not even on the team. I'm just saying it. Throwing it out there. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. We'll leave you in suspense of that. <laughs> um, so, who did you have at 11? Then? I have the Shandu Dranthera. Or Shanghai oh, Dragons. Nice. Yeah, yeah. You know, the uh, completely restructured Shanghai Dragons. Uh, they are not going to go 0-28. You know, they're not... Well, would, at that time, it would be 0 you know... Quite a bit, 0-68, not happening. 
Uh, so Shane High completely restructured. They only kept three players. They kept Dia, Kikuri, Fearless. Uh, they dropped, you know, Zushu, Roshan, Alt Rain, Five King, Free Feel Sky, uh, Damon, uh, Otto was the other one. He signed to Washington Justice. Uh, so it's he's not going to be on another crapshoot of a team. Uh, so they went out. They signed a bunch of the runner-ups who lost a runaway. Uh, maybe I shouldn't say lost a runaway. The team that had the best grand finals in contenders history. It was a very yes. close series. Either one of those teams would have walked away and gotten poached with the performances that they gave. Whether they won or lost, it happened. All the components are signed to the Overwatch League in this season, and that's fantastic. And, you know, these are... I mean, both with Runaway and uh, KDP. You know, th these are tried-and-true rosters who time and time again get picked up. These organizations know how to cultivate talent. And now it's time for them to take that next step. So, it, it, it's really hard to say how they're going to integrate into the Shanghai Dragons. I don't know if the three players that the Dragons kept are going to be hurt by this coexistent synergy that are already on this roster. But I'm glad that Dragons are finally at the point now where they're like, you know what? We're going pretty much full Korean. Like, you either fully commit or you don't commit at all, and we're finally going to see them make that next step. So I expect... A pretty drastic turnaround for Shane High, forehead, because, you know, they didn't win a match. Uh, so, in Stage 1, guaranteed they're going to win a, they're gonna win a match. It's going to happen. Will it be Week 1? I don't know. You know, it could be one week, it could be two weeks. But, if I was to put an over-under on how many games Shane High is going to win this year... Oh, man, this is tough. Okay, so 28 games... I think I had 11. I'm going to say... Mm, this, you know, this is really hard. <laughs> I would put him just over 500. I, I feel like I will give him 15. 15, okay. I mean, I like the team. I have them ranked higher. Mm -hmm. Um but that will be for next week. But I think their whole team revolves around one component, and that is how Fearless deals with, uh, you know, the invasion of the Kangdu Panther. Because he's the only tank they have. Like, there's no ifs, ands, or buts about it. Fearless is their tank. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, you have Guardian and Gaguri as the other tanks, and neither one of them play any form of main tank. So, like, they have one main tank on this team, and Fearless is it. So, it's how Fearless deals and plays with the invasion of the Panthera. So, that's, I think, is going to be the biggest thing with this team. So, um, so you had them at uh, 11. Mm -hmm. My number 11 team is the LA Valiant. Okay. Um, which is, it's weird because it's... Because lost... I had them ranked higher. You have them ranked higher. What? 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 But here's the thing. They they took fourth? Was it fourth they took? I can't remember who won the, the third place game. Because really, I, I didn't even watch that. Because <laughs> um, <laughs> really, what's the point? You know. Um, mm -hmm. But they lost one player. They lost soon. Um, and it's not like they have, like, a bad DPS line, like, without Soon there. Like, they had an abundance at DPS. So they lose Finzi and Soon. Uh, Finzi is... Uh, whatever. You're never getting played Finzi base there. Like, right. plain and simple. Space is there, you're not playing. So they basically, they got Agilities, Kareev, and Bunny, and KSF instead of like those four people and then just without soon like that's the only difference they had um the big thing for me is and one thing i noticed with the pro pugs and I, this is why i have them at higher up is 
Kareev is going to be their their number two DPS. Mm -hmm. uh, just the way, like even in the pro pugs, they're picking him to play DPS in the pro pugs. He is going to be their number two DPS behind Agilities. Like those two are going to be their two DPS stars. But he's going to come in for situational stuff. He's more of a tracer type player. Uh, KSF is going to be probably their fourth player. Their tank line is... I, I like their tank line. Mm -hmm. They have a good tank line in Fate and Space. That's probably one of the best in the league. Their support line sucks. Um, Custa's good. Again, to me, Custa falls in the... The Raucous. Everyone loves Custa. Everyone loves playing with Custa. Custa's good. Custa's not great. He's a fan favorite, but he's not the best of the best. He's definitely worth a starting support player. Definitely. They have Izayaki as the other support, really. Because if they're not they're not playing Kareev on support, Izayaki is their other support. They don't have any other support on the team. So Custa and Izayaki, and I'm probably saying Izayaki wrong, but that support line is not the best. It's not what I think is going to work for this team. So that's really the reason that I lowered them a little is because their support line just meh, meh, meh. They have an above average Custa and Izayaki. I just, you don't know much about because he didn't really play because they had Kareev on support a lot mm -hmm. last year. So you never got to see him play, but I think it's pretty clear that Kareev is going to be the DPS player on the team. Um, I bet they really wish they still had Unco, um, but then they wouldn't have had Custa. Uh, right. But I, that was probably one of the most shocking things about this offseason is that they did not address their second support at all. To to that point, though, like you did see Aziaki pop up a lot in their social media stuff. Mm -hmm. Which was a, a pretty big indicator that, hey, like, don't forget we have this guy, uh, and I just want a quick note that on the Overwatch League website, they basically got rid of the flex role altogether. And if you've been on there, you might have noticed that your boy Kareev is marked as DPS. He is. Now, so, like, he's legit not... Right. Support. I mean, that doesn't ab absolutely 100% guarantee that he will be DPS over support, but with how much... Uh, this staff likes Izayaki. Chances are, Kareem is going to be that second DPS locked in. So definitely keep an eye on that. Uh, mm -hmm. But I'll talk more about the Valiant next week because I do have them a little bit higher. Uh, so with that being said, Ed, I know we're nearing that two-hour mark uh, right now. So let's go ahead. Let's close out the show. So if you guys want to help us out, one of the best ways to do that is to go leave us a review over on iTunes. I was looking for feedback and constructive criticism to offer us insight on how we can improve the show. Uh, so we did get uh, three reviews, actually, this week. And Ed, I want you to take the first one because it is from <laughs> America's Top Hat up in Canada. Okay, so our first five... That... Parentheses, Canada. <laughs> Totem, ten stars. Ed... Zero stars. Average of five. Yes. <laughs> I will take that average. So and thank you for that. And if you're unaware of what that's referring to, go back a couple of I mean, episodes and you'll know exactly I'm, what. <laughs> I'm not the biggest Canada supporter. No, but we... We we, we, uh, we said we, these exact things on the podcast. Yes, we did. <laughs> yeah, like we even each other out. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Uh, so our second review uh, comes from Twin Cam at nineteen oh one. This is a five star review. Uh, it says, "Dead set listener from Australia. Love the content. Really enjoy Ed's rants and tangents. Only yes. one criticism is: could you do more coverage on Australian contenders? Like to hear a little more. I know you guys do a bit already. Keep up the amazing content, please. Best wishes in a new year from an Aussie." Okay, so. The, the biggest thing about contenders coverage is how to actually go about incorporating it. Like, there's there's different ways to do it. Like, we could basically uh, cover everything, 
and go over results, uh, which honestly, like, is okay, but as a listener, I know I wouldn't be interested in that, and I feel like that would be a little bit too run-on, just, you know, hearing numbers constantly. Uh, but, you know, we, we do have these other playoffs that are happening this week. Uh, I know South America has their grand finals here this weekend. Uh, Australia is in their semifinals. And when there's no NA going on, which is what we primarily focus on, I am always open to that idea. So, I'll say this. Uh, next week, we'll cover uh, South America. I know Pacific also has their grand final, so maybe we'll dive a little bit into both of those, but we're not going to do deep analysis. It will be more takeaways, uh, not so much the map-by-map stuff. And then, you know, Korea will be covered on Overwatch League Network. And then, you know, the week after, or actually, no, it'll still be the same week. Uh, well, we'll go over the results of Australia next week, and then for the finals, we'll do a deep dive. I, I feel like yeah, that's yeah. more fair, just because it, it lets us kind of look at each one. Uh, and it focuses on the bigger picture, uh, because this is when money is on the line. So we'll we'll do that for you for sure. And Wait, I know, is money on the line, or, or is, is it lizard, lizard bucks? bucks? Oh, you know what, Ed? That's a good point. I honestly, <laughs> to be honest, I don't know off the top of my head. I just know that the numbers are extremely skewered across all the regions outside of NA, EU, and Korea. I don't know how, where all the chips fall. Uh, so you do bring up a good point. Uh, but we'll focus on the grand final matches for these other regions uh, over these next couple of weeks. And we'll maybe we'll figure something else out in the near future. But for now, that's what we'll do for you, Twin Cam. Uh, so with that being said, thank you so much for reviewing Ed. We have one more review, so why don't you take this last one? All right, our last review of the day is another five-star review from Rival Drift. It says, hey guys, thank you for keeping me entertained at work and up to date with all things Overwatch. From news, in-game changes, and upcoming Overwatch merch that I will throw all my money at, keep up the great work. Well, thank you very much, Rival Draft, for that. We will keep you up to date on all of that, and as long as you throw your money at stuff not related to the Canadian teams or the Boston <laughs> Uprising, you are A-OK in my book. If you do that, and and you know, if you want to throw money somewhere, you know, you could you could always support Segway. the Patreon. <laughs> I mean, it's it's brand new. Uh, so we recently launched our network's Patreon page for those that want to support our Overwatch podcast network even further, and we got tiers starting at just one dollar a month. And, you know, I am absolutely terrible because I don't actually have the page up. I know since last week we at least have two new uh, patrons. So let me quick pull it up really quick and then we'll go over the other stuff. Uh, so special shout outs to It's Evil John and Grindcore for our newest pledgers. Uh, so thank you so much for that. And, you know, our network grows. You know, we, we have a new project that... I uh, got off the ground this week. Still waiting mm -hmm. on iTunes verification. You'll let people know, you know, where or when they can find it here in just a minute. But if you want to find other great Overwatch content out there, whether it's Overwatch, Overwatch League, Path to Pro content, you do so by visiting our website, owlnshow.com slash owrecall. And then episodic listens are released on our Twitter every Sunday night. So it's just the easiest way to find the latest episodes from all the podcasts out there. So be sure to follow Overwatch Recall on Twitter at OW Recall. Now, Ed, you know, our network expands. We have new stuff coming. We have a number of ways that our listeners and viewers can get a hold of us. So why don't you let them know how they can do that? All right. Well, you can reach us on email at, at gmail.com. Uh, we do have the website. That's OWLNshow.com. We have a YouTube channel, youtube.com slash C slash Overwatch League Network. Uh, we are on Discord, so you can reach us there at discord.me slash OWLN show. We are streaming presently live on Twitch at twitch.tv slash OWLN show. We are a Twitch affiliate, so help support the show by subscribing to our channel and earn a network emoticon. 
Uh, our podcast network does stream pretty regularly, so use your Amazon Prime and subscribe to us as soon as you can. We do have the Overwatch League Network airing Mondays at 7 p.m. Pacific. Our brand new passion project, OWL by the Numbers, our fantasy Overwatch League podcast, will be airing Tuesdays at 6 p.m. Pacific with me and Totem. And then we have Blazing Bob and then Julian uh, will be over there with us. And then Heroes Never Die, this current show you're listening to, is our variety Overwatch show, which is p.m. Pacific. And then host streams will, when available, will be on Thursdays and Fridays at 7.30 p.m. Pacific. So, like, after the show here, me and Totem will probably go on and play some arcade games on our alt accounts to get them up to level 25. Uh, and then Totem actually mentioned it earlier. We have a Patreon uh, page at patreon.owlnetwork. So we recently this and uh you know we would really appreciate the support like totem said one dollar two dollars five dollars twenty dollars i don't know can they go up to 20 i, I feel they could it's um it's one two fifty five and ten all right all right one two fifty five or ten donate if you feel like it if you don't no real pressure but we would really like the support um so yeah you can reach me personally on twitter at at Adenar overwatch or, sorry, at Adnar O W. E D A N R A N A R O W. Wow, I can't spell. Um and <laughs> I stream occasionally on Twitch at at uh, Adnar Overwatch. Totem, where can they find you? <laughs> well you can find me on Twitter at Totally Drunk C T R. And if I'm live, of course it'll be on our podcast network Twitch channel at twitch.tv slash O W L N show. But, guys, that is going to do it for us here tonight on Heroes Never Die. Again, this has been episode number 143. I am your host, Totally Drunk, joined every week by my co-host, Edinar. And we will see you guys here in probably 20, 30 minutes, hopefully, uh, yeah. for some arcade shenanigans. shenanigans. Uh, so if you guys want to group up whatever, please let us know. Uh, we'll have spots open for sure. But for now, we hope you have a good night. And we look forward to seeing you soon. Have a good night. Have a good one. Thank you for listening to Heroes Never Die. Be sure to follow us on Twitter at HND Overwatch. And join us on Discord at discord.me slash OWLN show.